we're starting a nonprofit too, which is the thing that's actually most dear to my heart, called the Health Assurance Movement. And that is going to be ways to be assured you're healthy rather than insured, which you're, as you know, your insurance covers you when you get sick, but not necessarily teaches you how to be healthy or keeps you healthy. So doctors are amazing at saving your life, but not always getting the training in nutrition and lifestyle in school, and most MD and DO programs don't really teach much nutrition. So the schools I went to, which are naturopathic and chiropractic, teach a lot of nutrition, and I have some side degrees in nutrition. And what you eat, what you put in your body, what you surround yourself, the energy of your family, your close unit, and your food, what you literally are surrounded by and put into you, has a huge impact on your body. And um, it's very important. But um, yeah, I did live in Libertyville for six months. It was great. I was right on River Road by Independence Grove, and it was a fantastic experience, but a little bit too far of a commute. So I understand and appreciate the patients who do come to visit us and value their time greatly. Um, so, yeah, do you want to pass around the cards? Because that'd be nice. Um, there's a couple times I might, like, call on people, and if you are distracted, sleeping, <laughs> don't want to answer, feel uncomfortable, you can just say pass. Um, but we'll have a couple like mini quick activities for people to get um, involved a little bit. So, yeah, I guess if you have a question, great. We can, I'm hoping to get some Q&A at the end. So a lot of people would ask for like themselves or their kids or their parents, like what their health issues are. And if you want to learn about that, I'm really happy to talk about it. This is going to be the framework we're going to lay out, which is talking two acronyms. This is like a big picture way to view your health, which is what is in my book, but we're going to give you the breakdown about 20 minutes as quick as we can to get the general like framework of how to view your health from a big picture perspective. And um, yeah, I'm also trying to be funny. I'm doing some stand-up classes on Tuesday nights. <laughs> so hopefully I don't like say some jokes that offend people. So if you do, you can just like walk out, go to the salt caves get a cocktail, cool off a little bit. Hopefully it's not too bad. Um, so what do I want to start out with? I guess um, let's talk about mm, all right, let's talk about um, fire. So some abstract concepts. Chinese medicine talks about these the f what they call the five elements, which is fire, earth, metal, water, and wood. And the adrenal glands go mostly with the fire element, which is your heart, small intestine, and hormonal systems of your thyroid and adrenal glands. And the f adrenals are adrenal, which sits right on top of your renal gland, your kidney, which is in your low back. So right on top, there's like this little triangular, little party hat looking thing that is called your adrenal gland. And it secretes different hormones, which are the four S's we'll talk about. And fire is a really good thing to have in your life because of the fire element in Chinese medicine is about joy, the heart. It's about passion and life purpose. So um, we'll talk about the sci most science-based adrenal issues and what that comes from, but from a more existential or emotional life purpose path. Um, sometimes your adrenals get fatigued or pooped out when you don't feel like you have a reason to get up in the morning. So when you have a physical adrenal problem or when you have a spiritual emotional adrenal problem, um, it's, it's sort of that loss of fire or like vitality of life is one of the big keys for your adrenals. And fire is often thought of as a negative in conventional and even alternative medicine because they talk about fire as inflammation. Inflammation is a really bad thing when it's out of control. It's like a fire that's gone wild, like a raging forest fire. It's not necessarily bad. Um, you just want to have that fire be for a purpose. So it's using that energy for a reason. Um, and inflammation is there for a reason. It's either there um, to usually kill an infection or to deal with a toxin or some kind of injury. So people think of it getting the flu, influenza, where you get a really hot and fever and achy. Those are very classic concepts of inflammation or the negative fire. So um, just because it is heat inflammation fire doesn't mean it's bad. So when you do have the flu, that's a good fire that's meant to bring your temperature up <coughs> and kind of boil your blood, so to speak, to kill the bugs that are inside of you. Um, and there's um, a concept which is also really important to talk about, which is that your body is both innately intelligent, as Mary talked about, and also 
kind of dumb. So <laughs> all of us are a little bit dumb. Like if your random thoughts that you were just like thinking all day long, you spoke and just like stream of thought spoke, you'd probably have tons of blonde moments, but luckily we don't all say everything we're speaking. Um, so your body is dumb sometimes. So when you do get the flu or if a child gets a flu, sometimes the fever gets too hot and they get a seizure. And that's usually where Western medicine comes in, is your body is malfunctioning. It's dumb, it's stupid, it's not working right. And sometimes that is the case. Like sometimes you cut off your finger, sometimes the flu gets too hot, you get a seizure. Sometimes um, bad things happen and you need severe intervention. You need a doctor to save you. But other times the inflammation is a good thing and the real question is why is it there? So we're looking in alternative medicine more at your body's being smart, it's doing the best it can with what it has at the, any given moment and we're looking to figure out why it's happening, what was the root cause or causes that led this condition to happen. So it's a big mindset shift to think like, oh my body's doing the wrong thing, rather than thinking, wow, my body's probably doing the best it can, but maybe I'm just not giving it the right fuel for its own fire, so to speak. Um, so uh, we won't talk about drugs yet, we'll talk about that later because that's fun. Um, the main thing is you just want your fire to be more of like a slow simmer rather than a huge um, overflowing bonfire. And there are certain things that will cause lots of inflammation like a really inflammatory diet, um, lots of caffeine, alcohol, and inflammatory foods and chemicals um, that either bother your liver or bother your kidneys where the adrenals are housed. Um, adrenals are also where the word adrenaline comes from, so that's one of the S's we'll talk about, but adrenaline is rooted in adrenal. So just a connection is somewhat clear, but um, often unsaid. Um, okay, another big concept I wanna get to before we cover this is patients who come in the first time, whether it's them or um, like a wife who's dragging the husband in, they say, I don't believe in alternative medicine. And it's not something you have to believe in, it's literally just Newtonian science. There is an element of emotional healing, which is more quantum physics and quantum science, but alternative medicine is not something you need to believe in, it just works. If you fill your body up with the worst possible foods, it's going to react badly. Think about having McDonald's three times a day, putting in a bunch of uh, hydrogenated oils and fried chicken all the time, versus eating a really like healthy plant-based diet with some grass-fed burgers. It's gonna act a lot differently. If you have milkshakes all day, you're gonna be a little bit hyper and then tired, and then hyper and then tired, and you're gonna feel heavy, and Chinese call it damp, like you're weighted down and heavy, like saggy fluid-based, um, like you're filled with quicksand or just water weight. Um, so, um, essentially, you don't really have to believe in alternative medicine, it still just works. Um, yeah, it's kind of like we get a lot of doctors, um, I have a patient who's a um, wife of a oral surgeon and the oral surgeon's like, I don't believe in natural medicine. Vitamin D is junk science, but I like probiotics, but 20 years ago he didn't think probiotics mattered. So a lot of alternative doctors like Dr. Van Hulo's practice I took over, when they started in the 70s and 80s, probiotics, vitamin D, B12 were complete like junk science, considered quackery. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. And you can, if you don't have B12, if you're on a vegan diet, not supplementing with B12 or being careful about getting B12, can cause blindness. So it's not like vitamins don't do anything. It's more just that you need to understand how they work. And um, <coughs> going to see any type of healer, whether it's a massage therapist, acupuncturist, chiropractor, naturopath, um, um, or an MD or DO who specialize in integrative or functional medicine, their primary um, goal is to increase your function, which is the F here. So that is the fastest way to get better, is to see a functional practitioner. It's different than functional medicine. Functional medicine is a clever rebranding of let's find the root cause of what's going on. So they tend to spend an hour or more with you. They look at your whole life story and history, hopefully, and they run more what's called functional tests to look at optimal lab ranges. And it's just a, something that was practiced years and years ago, but because we have not enough doctors in this country, we don't have enough time for the doctors to see everybody, which is super unfortunate. And then the doctors like me or doctors who go into um, their own membership-based practice don't have the um, ability to be able to be covered by insurance, unfortunately. So a lot of them go to a cash pay where it's 100 to 
thousand dollars an hour for some of them. Um, and it's just unfortunate that it's not covered by insurance, which is why we're starting a nonprofit where there's free online health education. But um, functional medicine is one of your better type of practitioners to see because they will spend the time to figure out that root cause of what's going on. It's something that most doctors know how to do, but they either specialize and don't look at the big picture or they're um, just not having enough time based on their practice model and what their insurance model covers. So um, just a big concept. So functional is the first, or function is the first acronym here. There's really three words that are super important. It's function, excess, and deficiency. And the excess and deficiency are the two main things you can do for yourself, which is avoiding all of the excess bad things that you're doing and adding in all of the good things that you're not doing. So you're either, you have an excess of bad inflammation or a deficiency of maybe fuel for your fire. And um, the function piece is when you see a practitioner who increases your function. So this could be, um, like I was saying, any type of usually natural practitioner or healer, and they're going to increase your body's function from the time you walk in to the time you walk out. So this could be you throw your back out, you go to see a chiropractor, they crack it or put it back into place, and you walk out with less pressure off of that muscle, less tension off of that nerve, and you're instantly better. You go see an acupuncturist with a headache, they put a needle right here, you can massage on yourself called LI4 in the web of your hand when you have a headache, it's a great trick. Um, and you instantly feel better from the headache. It can be instantaneous, it can take 10, 20 minutes, but they do something that increases your body's ability to function, to process the information that's coming in, to balance some of your um, structure, chemical, or emotional issues, and you instantly feel better. And I say seeing practitioners who increase your function is like eating dinner. Just because you don't like a meal doesn't mean you stop eating. You might not like that meal, so you might not like your doctor, you might not like that healer, it might not be a good fit. Maybe they're rude or arrogant or they talk about the wrong politician that you don't approve of. But at the end of the day, it's really good to have some form of self-care. And if you can have a self-care with a practitioner that's something that you can afford either monthly or weekly, that's super good. I know I almost didn't get into chiropractic school because um, the nine out of 10 chiropractors who I shadowed would try to see people three times a week for three months, two times a week for three months, once a week for three months, and then weekly pretty much forever. And that is something that will help your body to function better. However, it's not vitally necessary as much as they tell you it is. And um, it's something that I do believe in is in self-care, but the more you can do for yourself, how well, they call it self-care, the less you have to see somebody. So the more you control the excess bad and good in your life, the less you need to be saved by either going to the hospital or by going to a uh, natural healthcare practitioner. So something to think about. Um, luckily, I did find a chiropractor who spent a long time with people. He did often run late, which is a big pet peeve of mine, but he um, spent enough time to figure out the root cause of why people were having pain and then was able to get them out of it and would spend half hour, sometimes an hour with people because um, he cared about them, which I think is important. Um, okay, so function. This is the fastest way to get better. The next fastest way to get better over any condition is to get rid of all the excess bad things in your life. So I'm going to have everybody do is stand up. Don't spill your drinks. <laughs> you can. Okay, and I want you to think of, let's say, three bad things that you're doing for your health already. Once you think of three things that you're doing that might not be the best, whether that's too much alcohol, caffeine, stress, negative thoughts, um, posture, driving the car too long, sitting at your desk too long, your bed is old, whatever it is, walking your dog and you're letting your dog pull you down the road. As soon as you think of three things, you can sit down. <laughs> three things. <laughs> Healthiest one stands last. <laughs> We have a healthy one. Okay, great. So as you can see, we all do things that are bad for us. <laughs> That's normal because you have, you have this inner child that constantly kind of wants to be doing the wrong thing for you. And it's also normal to not necessarily do things that are the healthiest because physically it might not be healthy, but it could be healthy for your mental state. Kind of like having a cocktail. Um, 
I was talking to my acupuncturist, who's a five element style acupuncturist, who are much more into the whole mind, body, and spirit concept. And he said his teacher, who actually started this whole five element acupuncture concept, who's an Englishman, would tell some patients after they got treated, when they had an earth issue, which is your stomach and spleen, also your earth is your community and your home life. When they would have an earth deficiency, he would tell people, go have a beer tonight. And the reason why he would do that is not because the beer is good for your liver. He would tell them that because they needed that nurturing of community and talking and love that having a beer at the local English pub brings you. So sometimes because it's physically not a great thing for you, it can still be an emotionally good thing. It's kind of like having your wine with all of your girlfriends. Um, it might not be physically healthy, but it might be really nurturing in other ways. But what you can do is get some drinks from Mary <laughs> because she has really healthy cocktails you can have. And luckily a lot of bars in Chicago and the suburbs are starting to carry mocktails and other things. So it doesn't always have to be um, avoiding all the bad things. But one of the second fast way to get better is to get rid of some of the bad things, whether you go on a diet, a cleanse, a detox, alcohol-free January, they do dry Januaries, that type of thing. The more you limit all the excess bad things, the faster you feel, usually within days to weeks. What takes a long time is deficiencies. So some organs heal quickly, like your skin and your mouth can heal within a few days to a few weeks. My dad's a dentist and luckily he doesn't have to deal with a lot of people having pain after more than a few days because your mouth heals super fast. Your stem cells are just on high turnover in your mucous membranes. So skin things like when you get a cut heals really quickly. You literally get to see the innate intelligence of your body happening in minutes, um, which is cool. Um, you can even put like a time lapse of the, I've done this, you put a time lapse of the scar and you can watch it heal like watching a plant grow. It's pretty cool. Um, and then, so this takes time. Your adrenals do take eight months to fully regenerate. Your liver takes about eight months. Your brain takes years. So when you're dealing with someone with dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, that takes a lot of therapy, a lot of functional support, a lot of removing the excess bad things. Um, but the deficiencies are where the money is at. That's like your money maker. So that's finding, taking either herbs, vitamins, supplements, or any kind of lifestyle things to increase your current deficiencies. And that's how you get a lot stronger. It's kind of like in maybe the business world where you're saying like focus on your strengths, but work on your weaknesses. You want to focus on your health strengths, which is sometimes more of your function or the excess things, but you still slowly work on your weaknesses to improve yourself. Um, the UP is less important, but it's ugly patients. So not that my patients are ugly, but patients like with time <laughs> is important. So ugly is all of the things that you don't want to talk to your practitioner about. And I've been there. It's like talking about all of your deepest emotional core false beliefs. It's like talking about the wart on your toe or the lump on your butt or the smelly armpits you get after you eat dairy or whatever it could be. It's just talking about those parts of you that might be a key critical component for your practitioner, but um, if you're not being vulnerable and sharing that, they can't help you as well. So sometimes people go, well, I've been to a lot of people, but I'm like, well, have you told them that you're having insomnia because of all this major stress that's happening in your life? And they're like, no. So I'm like, well, that's probably why you're not getting better if you're not sleeping better. One of the questions we had beforehand was, how do you differentiate adrenal fatigue from sleep issues? And you can't. So fatigue is just a name for low energy and you don't really know. I say if you're not testing, you're guessing. So it's really important to find a practitioner who can diagnose, run tests, and really find ways to know what's going on. And doing sleep studies is vitally important, mostly for your heart and your brain, which are two things you really want to keep in life. Um, I guess I'll plug my dad. My dad's a dentist in Lake Forest, Campbell and Schmidt Dentistry, and him and many other dentists do sleep studies, so definitely ask your dentist about that, especially once you're probably over 50, so maybe 60, 70 years old. If you're snoring or if you're waking up tired, it's definitely worth getting a sleep study um, because it can cause um, some of the like senility, you know, um, older moments of loss of memory um, can play a role in dementia and heart disease. And if you're tired and you're snoring, definitely get a sleep study. Um, but there's really no great way to screen yourself besides just seeing if a partner
finds out that you're snoring <laughs> or not. Um, but if you wake up tired or if you feel like you're waking up at night a lot, um, sometimes even waking up at night to pee more than once can be a sign that you have sleep apnea. Um, definitely something to think about. Um, yeah. So um, we, I've seen his dad, my son, he does also has orthodontia there, but um, there are some issues. And we did a sleep study. So the practice is in Lake Forest, which isn't too far. And you can do this, you need to do a sleep study. There's one right across from the um, soccer complex, is right here, close to the Bell. So that's convenient. Yeah. But it was super helpful. And he's like, yeah. so glad you it's, found uh, it. Some issues that we've been struggling with for years, when with the daughter too, with TMJ dysfunction, they specialize. So, yeah, yeah, they're great. Practitioners. Um, it's really cool when you go if you have like this giant mass on your neck that grows, and you go to a practitioner and they give you like an herb or stick a needle in it, and it just falls off the next day, which has happened. It's even more cool if you don't grow the lump in the first place. So that's the importance of preventative <laughs> medicine. So if you get your colonoscopy done, if you get a thermogram or a mammogram done, if you get a sleep study done, if you get your blood work done every couple years, if you look at more functional blood work for inflammation, those are all really important ways to look at how your body is functioning so you can be assured that you're healthy. Um, my, one of my favorite assurance methods is blood work. Um, and I should tell you this because I want all of you to know this. So the two best, um, blood test to have done and added into your yearly ones besides vitamin D is called HS crap CRP and <laughs> if it's high you should be worried and the other one is homocysteine so that's homo like homo sapiens C-Y-S-T-E-I-N-E -E. um, those two are really important at looking at inflammation in your body which is like that bonfire that's boiling you from the inside out, could cause clogged arteries, could cause dementia, could cause diabetes, could cause all kinds of like organ damage. It just depends where it is. Inflammation is the silent killer, so to speak. That's the big name for it right now. And it hits you at your Achilles heels or your physical weak spots. So if you have like a knee that's injured from a long time ago, and you might have like a t half partially torn meniscus from like an old soccer injury or something, when you get inflamed, you feel it in that knee. So you feel inflammation in your weakest points in your body. So let's say like you have a bad back and you went out and had a bunch of fried chicken and a couple of alcoholic drinks and the next morning like, oh, I'm so stiff and achy. Stiff, achy, um, achiness is a particular pain quality associated with inflammation. So if you have multiple joints that ache, definitely check out your inflammatory levels. Um, the CRP should be below one. Homocysteine should be below seven or nine, depending on who you talk to. Um, sorry for writing sideways, but seven or nine for homocysteine, below one for <coughs> high sensitivity, crap. <laughs> if this is over three, you should say, oh crap, I need to do something different. And definitely talk to either a nutritionist or a functional medicine practitioner for how to deal with these. What does the HS stand for? High sensitivity. So a lot of doctors will check CRP, which shows you if you have enough inflammation for an infection. The high sensitivity shows you more of like your overall um, cardiovascular um, and body inflammation. And I'm on the side and your hands are right in front of it. Can oh yeah. It's HSCRP. HSCRP. Yep. High sensitivity um, C reactive protein or cardiovascular reactive protein. So that's important. Then let's talk about more about the adrenals. So the adrenals are easily summed up in the four S's. The little one, the little one is I added later after I wrote the book called Sleep. Um, but they s adrenals secrete four types of hormones: salt, sex, sugar. I have a doctor's handwriting and stress. So the salt um, piece is you probably don't need to remember this ever, but secretes a hormone called aldosterone, which goes with blood pressure, BP, or blood pressure. So if you have really high or low blood pressure, or if you're craving salt or sugar, you could have an adrenal type of dysfunction. Sex is libido. So often this is, um, as you age, testosterone goes down for men and women, and um, your sex hormones can be deficient or low in adrenal type of issues. Um, the primary one you can test for is DHEA-S, 
like dog, hat, elephant, animal, dash, sleep, <laughs> D-H-E-A-S. Um, and for most people, that should be over 100. Um, usually 100 to 300 is great. Um, if it's low, your adrenal glands might be low. That's, this DHEA doesn't mean much. It's a pre-hormone that converts into your other sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. Um, and as you age, it has a tendency to go down, but it's not supposed to go down. It's another big concept is just because everybody has it doesn't mean it's good. Kind of like smoking in the 30s. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it healthy. Um, just because everyone has adrenal fatigue doesn't mean it's good. Recently there was an article that came out that said they raised the standard for average temperature in the body down to like 97. So it's acceptable to have your temperature be 97, which is crazy. Because before it was 98.6 as a standard. And you could go one degree below and one degree up, and that's considered normal. Some people run hot because they're more young, hot, inflamed. Some people are colder because they're deficient in hormones. And so a lot of women, 40% of Caucasian women, have hypothyroid, which is the sister gland to your brother, the adrenal gland. Um, and um, the let's teach you more because this is fun. So the thyroid often... Um, since so many people have it, and I'm sure like probably if you look around, half the people here probably have it, um, it's really important to test for. And the markers you want to get tested for are um, seven of them, actually. And most doctors only check one. I know, seven. It's like, yikes. Why is no one looking at this? It's really important. Um, and... RT3, TPO, and thyroglobulin. So, um, the thyroid. So part of why everyone's temperature is going down is because their thyroid is really low, and the thyroid is your major metabolic hormone. I'll tell you what that is. Um, so, <laughs> um, the thyroid controls your temperature. So one of the ways to check your thyroid is checking your temperature in the morning, um, like first thing when you wake up, and if it's low, Chronically, that was like an old school way in the 1920s that they would check your temperature and your, see how your thyroid was doing. Um, and you can also track your cycles that way as a female and lots of other issues. But um, essentially, um, most people these days have adrenal and thyroid issues and it's one of those things that's very common because everybody's overworking, not sleeping enough, stressed out, eating too much sugar and salt, and maybe they need to have more sex, I don't know. But um, <laughs> The hormones to check, most doctors will check TSH. Have people heard of TSH before? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Bonus points. So TSH, that's the thyroid stimulation. It's like pushing the pedal on your car. So you're stimulating your engine to go, but we don't know what's happening. So most doctors are like, oh, well, you're pushing hard enough, but we have no idea how fast you're going. Your car could be dead, not moving. You could be tired, cold, fatigued, dry skin, hair falling out. Thin skin, thin hair, thin nails. Nails are like ridged or cracked or having tons of issues. And you could have a low thyroid that they're not um, finding because they're only looking here. Your, the other hormones are T4 and T3. And T3 is the most important, but there's T4, T3, and then there's free T4, free T3, which are the active, most active forms that are not bound in your blood that get your body to work. And um, sometimes when people take vitamin D, they feel better instantaneously. It's like one of those deficiencies where you just take a high dose and you feel better for a few days. Part of that is because D3 gets thyroid hormone into every cell in your body, and the T3 goes and actually activates your DNA to kickstart your metabolism and get you energized. So that's the reason why sometimes if you're like, oh, I took D3 and my mood got better, or I felt better, it's because it's actually getting your thyroid to work, which is what most doctors check, but these matter. If you talk to endocrinologists who haven't been to school in the last 10, 20 years, they won't know much about this or they'll say it's nonsense, which is not true. Um, it's super important and it can cause, there's a really good book on thyroid, which I won't tell you because it's overwhelming. It's like 600 pages long, but there's actually 22 causes of thyroid issues. And he goes through like how to test these and um, all that. But I'll tell you his first name in case you have thyroid stuff, but it's Detis K. It's Karazian, which I don't even know how to spell, but Datis, he's an Indian guy who practices functional medicine and teaches all about this to tons of MDs and DOs all over the world. But the other three that are 
this one's a little important. It's reverse T3 or little r T3. When you're stressed, your thyroid hormone goes into this reverse mode where it's inactive and doesn't do much. So that's kind of like when you're stressed and tired, it's because you might just be too stressed, causing it, your thyroid hormone to inactivate. And then anti-TPO and anti-TG are two antibodies. So all you really need to ask for is like, can you check these things? You can also look up, just Google like full thyroid panel, and this will come up if you look up full thyroid panel. But the antibodies to the thyroid are in about 70 to 90% of low thyroid cases. And if 40% of American women have, or you know, Caucasian American women have this, that means that probably 35%, 30% of like the, all the females in um, like America have antibodies to the thyroid called Hashimoto's. And um, there's a lot of reasons for that, but you basically, it's where your body is forming kind of like an immune response against yourself. Which sounds really bad. That's like, oh no, my body's being dumb again, but it's not actually being dumb. It's really smart. The reason why your body is fighting your own thyroid is because you either have an infection or a toxin lodged inside your thyroid gland. The thyroid is a little bit like the canary in the coal mine. Um, it's one of the first things in your body to go. It's very sensitive. And one of the things it's sensitive to is heavy metals. So if you have like mercury or lead toxicity from something that can actually lodge in your thyroid and cause issues. There can also be different infections that lodge there that need to be, get cleared out. It's all stuff that's um, really fascinating. Um, the other thing, sometimes people when they go on the new fad, which isn't a fad, the gluten-free diet, um, they feel better, especially if you have the antibodies because gluten cross-reacts with thyroid antibodies. And, um, Synthroid, which is the main medication they give for low um, thyroid hormones, has gluten in it, which makes the autoimmune part worse. S yeah, so it's fascinating. Um, so synth you have to check to make sure that your s this brand of Synthroid that you're getting, levothyroxine, has no gluten as an inactive ingredient because that'll actually make it worse long term. I don't know why they do that, but uh, to me, it could be because it makes them more money because then you need more thyroid hormone over time. Or it could just be like an unfortunate cost savings mechanism, which is what I hope for. Um, okay, back to the S's. Sorry for the thyroid sidetrack, but I think a lot of people will find that useful. So sugar um, is cortisol. So if you're craving sugar or if your cortisol rhythm is off, that's going to cause you to be tired. Um, when you eat a bunch of sugar, it can spike your cortisol. Coffee and caffeine and black tea, green tea can also mess with some of your stress and cortisol hormones, which is why sometimes when you eat it, or when you drink a bunch of caffeine and then you don't have a meal, you get that like stomach cramping feeling. That's like usually a low sugar type of event after caffeine. Um, and then the stress piece is adrenaline. It's really epinephrine, or like epinephrine, but adrenaline is more of the stress piece. So if you're really stressed out for a long period of time, people are asking questions. If you have a lot of trauma in your childhood or recently people passing away, divorce, um, marital conflict, child conflict, which are the main stressors people have in financial conflict or stressors, that can play a role if you've been chronically stressed. And a lot of people say, well, how am I assured if I'm stressed or not? There are a lot of biofeedback devices that will tell you if you're stressed. Um, one of the best ones are heart rate variability trackers. So that there's like a whoop band, um, WH whoop. Um, there's also one called heart math, which clips on your ear and tells you how stressed you are. But um, there's different biofeedback, neurofeedback centers you can go to that look at your brain waves to tell you how stressed you are. But generally, we're we do know how stressed we are <laughs> if we're paying attention. So if you just slow down on the weekends and if you're breathing really fast or you're getting upset all the time or you can't sleep or um, you're finding that you have to go to a crutch of some kind of like food or liquid or, you know, vice, that could be a sign that you're more stressed. Um, so just the more self-awareness you have, the faster you heal. 
it's in the book, but the first step to healing anything is awareness. So that's really a diagnosis is a form of awareness. And the more you can test and figure out what's going on, the more you can have self-awareness or awareness that your doctor practitioner brings you, the faster you can get better. And a lot of people these days with chronic illness are not getting a diagnosis, which is the most important piece. Um, so that's the adrenal summary. Any questions on the S's? Yeah. What is the bottom one there for the thyroid? Thyroid, anti-TG. Yep, so there's T4, T3, free T3, free T4, TSH, reverse T3, anti-TPO, and anti-thyroglobulin. So there's two primary thyroid antibodies. There's a condition called Graves, which is hyperthyroid, which is much rarer. And those people usually get anxiety, fast heart rate, and they feel like jitter, like they've had caffeine all the time, and they're just a little more anxious and jittery. It's like probably less than 5% of thyroid cases, but there are extra tests that look at Graves' disease. Um, and those people, when it's really bad, their eyes actually will start to bulge out of their head. It's kind of scary looking. Um, Cool tip, uh, pro tip for low thyroid, you'll actually start to lose the outer third or even more of your eyebrow. So um, a lot of women over 60 start to lose the eyebrow because they actually have hormonal issues. Um, and hormone replacement therapy we should talk about, it can be really helpful um, after menopause, uh, especially with like vaginal dryness and energy and sleep. But if you're over-hormoning yourself with artificial or natural, even like the natural um, versions of hormones, can cause certain problems or risk factors. Too much estrogen can cause heart and certain cancer type of issues. Um, so you just want to get your hormones checked if you're getting hormone replacement therapy. I'm not a big fan of HRT, hormone replacement therapy, because if you do have a healthy thyroid and adrenal gland, you do a lot better after menopause. Um, because what happens is as your ovaries and um, uterus make less sex hormones, your adrenal and thyroid have to pick up the slack. Most